executives are not immune to governance failings. And without having institutional shareholders and the financial press that's watching over them, it means it's even more important for members to actually be the critical friend uh, exercising accountability of the board and helping ensure good governance. I remember on a project in Lesotho in Southern Africa going to visit a savings and credit cooperative and there was a notice on the wall that said the biggest threat to any credit union is its board. And what it was really saying is that unless you've got a very clear mechanism for openness and for transparency, for accountability, there is always the danger of abuse and governance failings. And certainly if I look in the late 80s and early 90s back in the UK, there was a whole series of governance failings. There's one chief executive officer who said, if you look behind every failure of a cooperative in the UK, it wasn't just an economic or business failure, it was a governance failure as well. That led to some very interesting work and a working party looking at what would constitute good cooperative governance. And at the heart of its report, it said the only ingredient of good cooperative governance was an active and informed membership that had available to it honest and fair information. Because if we also look back, it was also very easy in the past for some cooperatives to hide performance in detailed notes, uh, to have figures that said one thing, but a narrative that said, despite all of the adverse trading figures, well, Tales from the Planet Sunshine was one way of putting it, that there was an, optimi an over-optimistic outlook going forward. What this requires, again, is good communications, accessible meetings, a culture, I think, of democratic renewal, where there is an acceptance that board members should not go on forever, that there should be limitations of term, terms of office, encouraging new people. And one of the recommendations made in our corporate governance code was not only did this mean that there had to be training for directors, the mere fact that you were elected as a board member didn't mean you had the competences and skills to be a board member. I often draw the parallel with our political process and say merely look sometimes at parliaments in any of our countries and say does democratic elections alone mean you have the skills and competences to be an effective minister? You needn't comment on that in your own context. But what we have now is a commitment to education and training, not simply for existing board members, but also for potential board members. So hopefully going forward, they can hit the ground running, having had some real good training in terms of the skills that they need. We've also embedded this within a code of best practice on corporate governance for the corporate sector that not only builds on some of the standard codes that have been developed for the public sector and the private sector, but are customised to the specific characteristics of cooperatives. It also means being open in the reporting on governance that actually says alongside the publication of the financial statements, there'll be a statement on compliance with that corporate governance code. And our apex body can monitor that and ensure that we've got the best in terms of cooperative self-regulation and ensuring good governance standards for our cooperative sector. Mm -hmm.